In the first part of this video, we revealed how the emergence of writing in Mesopotamia, more than 5,000 years ago, gave rise to one of the greatest libraries in human history, the Library of Ashurbanipal. We discovered that instead of paper, knowledge was then sealed on clay tablets that revealed the secrets of deep antiquity. We also talked about how the discovery in the 19th century of this library sparked scholarly debate and rethinking of the historical events documented in the Bible. Then, to better understand the history of the library, we researched its creator Ashurbanipal, a king with a dark reputation known for his cruelty but also for his extraordinary passion for knowledge and the collection of written records and tablets. We've come to the point that S.R. Haddon, in his lifetime, divided power between the sons of Ashurbanipal, who became ruler of Assyria, and his brother, Shamash Shon Ukan of Babylon. Soon, however, their late father's greatest nightmare would become a reality. What he had striven all his life to prevent now seemed inevitable. Ashurbanipal and Shamashumkan. Right from the start, it was strange that Esarhaddon chose the younger Ashurbanipal over the older Shamashumkan, who should have traditionally gained the crown, heir, title after the death of their eldest brother. There were many theories so as to why Esarhaddon made this decision when he himself was the victim of disgruntled older brother. One theory holds that Shamash Shum Ukan's mother may have been Babylonian, while Ashurbanipal was Assyrian. As such, Isar Haddon chose the rulership based on the ethnicity of two wives who were the mothers of his two sons, respectively. Whatever the case might be, he didn't prevent the eventual dispute between the two brothers, although he certainly managed to avoid it from the beginning until his death. As you may have remembered, both Ashbenipal and Shamashum Ukin weren't originally meant for the throne. Shamashum Ukin might have been trained for a rulership since he was next in line, supposedly to send Nadan Apali, but Ashurbanipal was not, not until his coronation as one of the crown heirs, at least. However, Ashurbanipal was well versed in wide range of fields, from administration literature, history, hunting, archery, horsemanship, to scholarship. He was especially knowledgeable about scribemanship and priestly duties. There was even a theory going around that Ashurbanipal, being originally not intended to inherit the throne, was supposed to become a royal scribe or priest. He was tutored by some of the greatest teachers of his time, including Nabashar Usher, and Naba a Ariba. It was thanks to his extensive scholarly and educational background that Ashurbanipal wasn't only literate, but highly intelligent as well, with his knowledge comparable to that of high priests and scribes, a trait that many of his predecessors didn't possess. His love for learning didn't wane even after he became a crown prince and then afterwards the king of Assyria. During his 38-year reign, Ashurbanipal would command his soldiers and scribes together, copy or collect texts of any kind, including tablets made from clay, wood and wax, leather scrolls, and possibly papyri too. He also collected writing boards, wax-covered panels made from wood or ivory on which cuneiform could be inscribed. In total, Ashurbanipal may have been amassed of tens of thousands of texts in all forms, from private collections of scribes and priests, temples, and conquered cities. Among the largest collection of tablets that Ashurbanipal incorporated into his library, later on was taken from Babylon, of which would have happened even if he didn't fell. How Babylon fell was the story of which Esher Haddon dreaded when he was alive, but didn't anticipate to actually happen. It was, because of the rift between his two sons, the two inheritors of his empire. Even though Esarhaddon 
Meshamashun Ugin swore allegiance to Ashurbanipal and he ordered Ashurbanipal to stay out of his brother's affairs, it was only a matter of time before ill will grew between the two. There isn't actually any solid evidence that could explain why Shamashum Ukin revolted, but some believed it was due to the Shamashum Ukin's resentment toward his brother and desire for Babylon's independence that eventually led to war breaking out between them. Despite being the king in his own right and was even declared to be as one by a Syrian monarch, Shamashum Ukin felt that Ashurbanipal's shadow extended over his domain. Perhaps because he had assimilated in the culture of the kingdom and he was now ruling, but he also started to feel resentment toward his brother. After all, he was supposed to have autonomy, but Babylon was still subject to the whims of Assyria and he may have never felt truly in control of his own kingdom. In his mind, he is Ashurbanipal's equal and Babylon should be able to do whatever it pleased. Thus, after summoning support from other kingdoms, especially enemies of the Assyrians, and rousing his own people's desire for independence, Shamashum Ukin started to revolt in the year 652 BC. Meanwhile, Ashurbanipal and the Assyrian royal family side, they may have tried to avoid going into direct war. According to some legends, Ashurbanipal and their sister, Seru Uturat, even attempted to talk Shamashum Ukin out of the rebellion. However, the latter refused. There are also other instances in which Ashurbanipal may have attempted to de-escalate in the tension, but war was inevitable. As Shamashum Ukin gathered his allies from all around the empire, including the Phoenicians, Chaldeans, Arameans, Elamites, and his own people, the Babylonians. Ashurbanipal strengthened his military and roused his own companions, now launching a full offense against each other. For three years, war continued to rage on, while a number of minor players switched sides repeatedly, angering rulers of the both sides. At last, the war ended with the fall of Babylon and the death of Shamashum Ukin. How he died, nobody knew for sure but the most commonly believed cause was that he lit himself on fire on the day Babylon was sacked by Ashurbanipal's soldiers. Elam, one of the major supporters of Shamashum Ukin, didn't fare any better. In fact, they may have received the worst lot in all coalition intended to overthrow Ashurbanipal. During the war, Ashurbanipal attacked the Elamites and destroyed their cities. In one grisly account, his army cut off the heads of the Tumen, the Elamite king and other nobles, bringing them back to Nineveh. Ashurbanipal hanged their heads in his garden, near where he and his wife ate dinner, as a grim warning to everyone who tried to oppose him. Elam's misfortunes didn't stop there. When they were engaged in a civil war, Ashurbanipal took this as an opportunity to raise their cities to the ground include Susa, a principal Elamite city. He didn't annex Elam, but left it to its own terrible fate. In his own words, Ashurbanipal boasted how he desecrated the tombs of the kings and sowed the land with salt, effectively turning it into a wasteland. While Babylon survived after its fall, Elam did not. Its glorious civilization forever lost to time. Last years of Ashurbanipal and the slow death of a once glorious empire. Similar to his predecessors, Ashurbanipal worked hard to extend and secure his empire through many brutal military campaigns. He was generally successful in his conquest too. Unfortunately, his actions against Babylon and Elam eventually contributed to the downfall of the Syrian empire later on. After his death, possibly due to natural causes, his sons and grandsons weren't able to hold the empire together. The Babylonians, in coalition with other groups, revolted again and were eventually successful in gaining control over the weakened Assyria. Now with Elam gone, the Medes and Persians settled in their place. Later on, 
they would form a coalition with Babylonians to defeat Assyria. Even while Ashurbanipal was still alive, Egypt already gained its independence under Pesmak. Despite that, Egypt remained an ally of Ashurbanipal and Assyria even after his death and the crisis that followed. Ashurbanipal might or might not have seen it coming. However, the decline of the empire was clear from the perspective of an outsider. The bloody endless fighting among royals, the monarch's disconnection from their people, and the continued social unrest were present during the last years of Assyria. And to the growing dissatisfaction of vassal states, and enemy nations waiting for the opportune moment to strike. Assyria was already close to its deathbed during its reign, not to mention the damages he caused Babylonia, Elam, and other cities that might have contributed to the hastened end of the empire. It was only a short while after his death that Nineveh and Assyria would fall. Despite his endless campaigns and warmongering, Ashurbanipal still had a lasting legacy on the world at large. It was, during his reign, that many of the most important texts of Mesopotamian world was collected and preserved. Ironically, when the library was destroyed and burned with the rest of Nineveh, the fire baked the clay tablets hidden in the castle. Instead of destroying the history of Assyria, the coalition of attackers unwillingly helped Ashurbanipal realize his dream of his empire and culture being remembered thousands of years later. Ashurbanipal's legacy to the world. Brutal and unforgiving he may be, Ashurbanipal still found time to form what would become the most important library of ancient Mesopotamia. A patron of artwork and literature, Ashurbanipal continued to order in the copying, creation, and collecting anything of culture value. But Ashurbanipal was also deeply interested in other fields too. Besides securing ancient literature and historical texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh at Inma Ilis, he also collected countless books, aka clay tablets about religion, astrology, and sciences. He had texts about anything from botany to astronomy. His collection also included government documents, including royal decrees, official records, and historical inscriptions, as well as personal, royal, and foreign correspondence. Every document in every genre at the time in Assyria can be found in Ashurbanipal's library. Perhaps the only exception are texts that are too foreign to him, which he may not have considered to be anything significant, and texts from Elam, which he mercilessly erased from history. Some of the most important texts in Ashurbanipal's library are those that concern with deciphering omens and planetary placement. Assyrian kings, including Ashurbanipal, would consult these texts to interpret the motions of heavenly bodies, among other things, to decide on what to do next. This is especially crucial in those times when war and conspiracy against the empire was rampant. Ashurbanipal, being a highly learned man himself, could interpret these texts without a problem. He thought of himself as one who deeply understood the wisdom of Nabu, grandson of Iki, and the god of knowledge himself. In one of his inscriptions, he made such a proclamation, among other things. Ashurbanipal, within the palace, understood the wisdom of Nabu, the god of learning, all the art of writing of every kind. I made myself the master of them all. I read the cunning tablets of summer and the dark Akkadian language, which is difficult rightly to use. I took my pleasure in reading stones inscribed before the great flood. The best of scribal art. Such works are none of the kings who went before me had ever learnt. Remedies from the top of the head to the toenails, non-canonical selections, clever teachings, whatever persons to the medical mastery of the gods, Ninurta and Gula, I wrote on tablets, checked and collated, and deposited within my palace for pursuing and reading. It wasn't an empty boast though. Ashurbanipal was indeed one of the highly knowledgeable and educated kings in Assyria. It was thanks to him that we know so much about ancient Mesopotamia. 
Without the great library of Ashurbanipal, we might still have the impression that these curious places mentioned in the Bible, for instance, were simply a myth, or they never existed in the first place. These clay tablets painted a picture of a world gone by, helping us imagine what life was like back then, and in a way, giving us more understanding about our place in the world. I, Ashurbanipal, the great king, the mighty king, king of the universe, king of Assyria, king of the four regions of the world, son of Esarhaddon, king of the universe, king of Assyria, grandson of Sennacherib, king of the universe, king of Assyria, eternal seed of royalty. If you missed the first part of this video, we encourage you to watch it to piece together the whole story of this ancient epic. You'll find more intriguing videos on our channel.